Hello! In most of our videos, we have been playing with the non-Euclidean spaces. However, we have not played with the time dimension in them so far. In this video, we will combine spherical and hyperbolic geometry with relativistic effects. But before we travel to fascinating non-Euclidean worlds, let us start with the Euclidean geometry. The game you see here is Space Rocks. It is a clone of the classic game Asteroids. It is based on the Newtonian physics. If you accelerate, you move forever in that direction, unless you decelerate. It is pretty similar to how Newton imagined how the real world works. One interesting consequence of this physics is that we cannot accurately determine our speed. We know that Earth is moving very quickly around the Sun, but we do not feel it. That is because the whole Earth is moving with us. You can see this effect in this slide. The spacecraft is moving very quickly relative to the grid. Still, all the rocks are also moving at speed zero relative to the spacecraft. As a result, the spacecraft cannot tell it is moving just by looking at the rocks. We call it the Galilean invariance. However, today we know that our real world is more complex than this simple model. Some things can only be observed if we wait for a long time or if we move very quickly. You probably have not noticed, but the universe shown in this slide has been expanding while we, we were talking. Now, let's see what happens when we start moving very fast. According to the principles of special relativity, fast-moving objects contract. The closer their speed is to the speed of the light, the more contracted they are. Look at the moving objects here to see that effect. Well, we mean objects moving fast relative to you. If you accelerate, previously stationary objects will start moving fast relative to you. Another well-known relativistic effect is time dilation. It means that time passes differently for different objects. Note the clocks on the star and the spacecraft. They show the same time. However, if we start moving the spacecraft and then return, note that less time passes on the spacecraft than on the star. Now let us move to the spherical geometry. This is again space rocks, but played on a sphere. Just like in the Euclidean space rocks, after our spacecraft speeds up, it moves forever in that direction. In the Euclidean geometry, it moves in a straight line. On the sphere, it moves in a great circle. For the following spherical slides, we will be using the stereographic projection. While this is meant to be as similar to Newtonian physics as possible, there is one difference. Can you see it? There is no Galilean invariance here. In this slide, all the rocks are moving along geodesics. However, because of the non-Euclidean geometry, the stones no longer remain in fixed positions relative to the spacecraft. Eventually, here is space rocks in hyperbolic geometry. Again, there is no Galilean invariance. In hyperbolic geometry, people in the distant part of the spacecraft would feel pseudo-forces slightly similar to the centrifugal forces observed in rotating objects in our world. Most non-Euclidean games use a model of physics like that, or even something simpler. For example, in Hyperrope, you will not encounter moving objects that are wide. The widest moving object is the Kraken, which is just three tiles wide. Why is it so? Well, uh, because in the broader objects, the outer parts would move much faster than the object itself, which, believe us, 
would not be playable. But can we have a non-Euclidean game in which invariance holds? We can. For this, we should no longer try to simulate Newtonian physics. The game has to be relativistic. We need to use maximally symmetric spacetimes. We mean that not only the space, the sphere or the hyperboloid, has to be symmetric, but it also needs to be symmetric under the spacetime transformations that correspond to moving objects. Here is the De Sitter spacetime, which is a relativistic version of spherical geometry. Unfortunately, this spacetime works slightly counterintuitive. Its size stays constant. Yet, nearby objects get farther and farther away as time passes, so it feels like the spacetime expands exponentially. Still, this spacetime is symmetric. If we are using an appropriate frame of reference, the slice of spacetime at t equal to zero is always a sphere of the same size. If we fly too far away from the yellow star, we can never fly back to it due to the expansion. For the same reason, we can also never actually reach the other side of the sphere. As a result, playing in this spacetime can be fun. Just try to stay close to the yellow star as long as possible while avoiding the stars. If required, you can shoot down the stars with a limited number of missiles. For a high score, you will also need to replenish your resources by capturing fuel, oxygen, health and missiles. Now, this is the anti space spacetime, which is a relativistic version of hyperbolic geometry. As the name suggests, it is the opposite of the de space spacetime. Let's shoot a missile. Beware, it will eventually return to us. In anti de space spacetime, objects are pulled together instead of expanding. Note that missiles are moving at speed very close to the speed of light, which is why they look very squashed to us. We can get a stable world by adding rotation. Now this pull is countered by making the static objects rotate in a specific way. This creates a centrifugal force that counterbalances this effect. Look how the heptagons further away are squashed. This is the Lorentz contraction. Here we are using the Poincaré projection to view the world. Using the beltrami klein projection instead counterbalances the squashing, making all the heptagons look normal. As a result, we can actually get a world with a structure quite similar to the one used in Hyperrogue. Interestingly, there is also some similarity to the geometry with a strange name shown in our last video, and this is not a coincidence, but we will talk about it later. If the constantly spinning screen makes you feel dizzy, we can also automatically counter-rotate it. While it makes the geometry harder to understand, it looks cool as well. Oh, and there's one technical aspect we have not discussed so far. The game computes the coordinates of all objects in the spacecraft's frame of reference, which puts the spacecraft at the center and the current time at t equal to zero, and displays the slice t equal to zero of that spacetime. Due to the limited speed of light, this is not what the spacecraft would actually see. In this slide we present the, let's call it, visible state. Everything is seen at the moment that the spacecraft would actually see it.
Now, let's introduce a turret aiming to shoot us down. It may appear that it just shoots randomly. Well, it is as accurate as it could possibly be. However, due to the limited speed of light, it can only see the past of our spacecraft. As a result, it computes the shooting angle so that the spacecraft would get hit if it didn't speed up. We did speed up in the meantime, so it missed us. Let's see what happens if we do not accelerate. So, this is relative hell, a pair of games taking place in the sitter and anti the sitter space times. You can play it yourself either by itself or as a part of the Rogue Viz collection, which you can wishlist on Steam. See the link in the description. Have fun! So, this was a visualization of various spaces and space times. If this is just what you wanted, have fun playing Relative Hell. However, if you would like to know how these space times are constructed mathematically, please continue watching. Let's think about what Euclidean geometry is. Let us focus on three-dimensional Euclidean geometry. We need to define what points are in our space and how to compute distances between them. This, in turn, lets us define isometries, which means translations, reflections and rotations, which are transformations of the space that preserve the distance, treated as a template that we will use in other geometries. Here we apply a rotation. A rotated object will use its own coordinate system based on an isometry. In this new coordinate system, x is turned to y and vice versa. The Minkowski geometry is similar to the Euclidean geometry, except that we have two kinds of coordinates, space coordinates and time coordinates. In the square distance formula, for time coordinates, the square of the difference has a different sign. Again, we have isometries, but because of the different sign, these Lorentz transformations work differently. For example, they are based on hyperbolic sine and cosine. A moving object will use its own coordinate system based on a Lorentz transformation. In this new coordinate system, space is turned to time and vice versa. As a result, we get the effects we have already discussed, such as time dilation and space contraction. Just like Euclidean geometry, Minkowski geometry is maximally symmetric. Space-time directions can be classified as space-like, which means square distance greater than zero, light-like, which means square distance equal to zero, and time-like, in other words, square distance lower than zero. But if we have a point and a direction, we have an isometry that takes it into any other point and direction of the same time. Now let us discuss how to obtain spherical and hyperbolic geometries. The spherical one is relatively straightforward. We get the spherical geometry by restricting to the set of points in distance 1 from the chosen center. Distances are the arc lengths. Just like Euclidean and Minkowski geometry, spherical geometry is maximally symmetric. Every point and every direction works the same. To get hyperbolic geometry, we also restrict to the set of points in the same square distance but now we start with Minkowski geometry and the squared radius is negative or time-like. The obtained maximally symmetric manifold thus loses its time-like dimension and is purely a space. 
Therefore, in this model, every point in two-dimensional hyperbolic space is described with three coordinates. It may look scary, but it is very similar to how spherical geometry works. We just need to use hyperbolic signs and consigns instead of the standard ones. The usual 3D graphics also employ an axial coordinate and it is straightforward to apply 3D engines to work with spherical and hyperbolic geometry too, using these models. Here is how we add a time coordinate to the hyperbolic plane to get 2 plus 1D anti-decitor spacetime. As you can see, the construction is quite similar to the previous ones, and again, we get a maximally symmetric spacetime. The disk shown here is the hyperbolic plane at time slice 0, which means u equal to 0 and t uh, greater than 0. By rotating around the tu plane, we get the further time slices. Sadly, we encounter closed time loops which are impossible to simulate in a video game. However, we can unwrap our construction into the universal cover. The whole construction is almost the same as that of the first on geometry, universal cover of SL2R, shown in our last video. In fact, Relative Hell uses the RopeVis implementation of the space. However, the angular coordinate becomes time-like, making our spacetime much more symmetric, and the geodesics work in a much more intuitive way. Here is how we add a time coordinate to two-dimensional spherical geometry to obtain two plus one-dimensional deciter spacetime. The construction is very similar to a three-dimensional hyperbolic plane, but now the squared radius is space-like. We obtained a maximally symmetric spacetime again. Again, you can now see the slice at t equal to zero. The slide visualizes how the universe expands and shows how it looks from the point of view of an inhabitant. The whole sphere does not actually expand. This was a brief introduction to the mathematics of non-Euclidean spaces and spacetimes. For a longer tutorial on how to construct such words in a computer game or visualization, you can also read the draft of our book. See the link in the description. Thanks for watching and have a great rest of your day.